Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this session on changing the relationship between government and citizens through democratic innovations, which is part of the, um, the conference that here is being hosted in partnership between the OECD Observatory of Public Sector Innovation and the Slovenian Presidency of the Council of the European Union. Uh, and we would also like to acknowledge the support of the European Institute of Public Administration and the European Commission's Horizon 2020 programme. Um, before we, we dive into the session, I just wanted to also make a small note to all of the participants who are here joining us, uh, that on the right-hand side of your screen, you will find the chat, question and answer and poll module. So we encourage you to actively participate using those functions, and we will be monitoring them throughout the session to gather your input and questions for the Q&A at the end of the panel. Um, so my name is Claudia Schwalis. I lead the OECD's work on innovative citizen participation, and it is my pleasure to be moderating this fantastic panel today. Um, what we'll be talking about is about this broader shift in the relationship between government and citizens that is taking place through all sorts of democratic innovations that we see happening from the local right up to the international levels. And it's really great that here with us, we have really a broad range of people who are working at all of those levels, local, regional, also at the European Union level, uh, with this conference on the future of Europe, um, because it's really, I think, an important question when we're talking about kind of the democratic crisis and the future of government and the future of democracy going forward. Um, I think what we have, have seen is that people's expectations about uh, sorry, participation in public partic in public decision making has really changed over time. Um, we have quite a lot of evidence that citizens are less trusting of government. Um, there's also a question of how trusting government are in citizens, uh, but there's also a lot of evidence that people are more engaged than ever on issues that affect them and their communities. Um, they want to be able to contribute meaningfully to shaping decisions that are impacting them. Um, and so democratic in innovations of all sorts have been shifting power towards citizens and allowing them to inform and to also shape how policies and services are being designed. Um, so throughout this session, we will explore different examples of democratic innovations um, that are being designed and implemented in a way for citizen participation to be productive and for the effect of this on improving public decision making, but also on strengthening society's democratic fitness. Um, so first, let me just introduce the, the panel that we have with us. Um, so very delighted to have John Alexander, who is the founder of the New Citizenship Project. Pepin Kennis, who is an Agora MP in the Brussels Region Parliament. Zakia Elvan, who is co-founder of We Do Democracy in Denmark. Gaetan Ricard-Nioul, who is part of the Common Secretariat of the Conference on the Future of Europe. And last but certainly not least, Dan Podied, who is a PhD anthropologist. Uh, he works at the Research Center of Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts and is Associate Professor at the University of Ljubljana's Faculty of Arts. Um, so first, before I, I kind of dive over into some questions for you, um, we do have a polling question um, for people who are, who are with us here as participants in the virtual audience. Um, so the, the polling question, and I've been told this should pop up for, for people, um, is that are you more or less hopeful about the future of democracy today compared to the beginning of last year? Um, and so we will have the results of that in a little bit. Um, and in the meantime, that lets me turn over to you for, for some opening remarks and we'll talk about the polling question afterwards. So first of all, I wanted to open things with, with you, John, um, because I think that the work that you've been doing at the New Citizenship Project has really been you know, remarkable and important. And, you know, I would like you to talk about this work on reframing how we view people from seeing them as, as consumers to seeing them as citizens, and then what impact and what possibility that opens up when it comes to democratic innovation and rethinking the future of democracy. Thanks, Claudia. And it's a real joy to be here. I, I um, yeah, I think, I think that's the right place to lead in. I, uh, when we talk about changing the relationship between citizen and states, the, there's a sort of, 
there's a there's a need in a way to understand what our starting point is like what are we changing from uh and not just thinking of it as, as a sort of nice to nice to do and, and i do think where we are today my, my background actually is an advertising brand consultancy and the journey of founding the new citizenship project has been all about across different aspects of society organizations and institutions challenging the relationship between uh, between the individual and the organization that, that that is framed as a consumer relationship and i do think that 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 has come to infect and or or maybe has, has has sort of been the basis of our democratic relationship for quite a long time as well so if you think of i i would describe what we have today the default situation or as to some extent what you might call a consumer democracy where the, the role of the individual is to choose between the options that are offered to them and to have those options marketed to them rather than to, to actually be an active participant in shaping what those options are sometimes we talk about it as being the difference between choosing from the items on the menu and and, and being allowed in the kitchen and and i think that uh that's quite a helpful i hope distinction to make to to our uh, in terms of understanding what the shift we might be talking about might be and i think for, for the reason the sort of inspiration behind founding founding the new citizenship project was to say well, what what if we could make the relationship between the individual and the organization between the citizen and the state as as what if we could put the same kind of creativity and energy into that relationship into into the democratic relationship as currently goes into consumerism so so what why not put as much creativity uh, uh, this has been best put by uh, an artist by the name of yasmani arbaleda who's the artist in residence for the for the new york city uh, civic engagement commission and he, he the way he puts it he said what what is the flavor of democracy is democracy sticky and sweet like honey and if it's not why not because it should be and so i think that that's sort of where i'm coming from in this is like we 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 have an opportunity to make democracy something that and the relationship between the citizen and the state something that's joyful and meaningful and dynamic not simply something that's that's a sort of uh, uploading of, of, of a couple of kilobytes of data every few years the last thing i'd say as my opener is is i do think i th i think this is an existential challenge like i think i think this isn't just a nice to have i think this is an unless we change the relationship between citizen and state unless we embrace the opportunity to move into a more dynamic more participatory mode of democracy we risk losing democracy altogether and I think that, that, that there is a risk sometimes that people like us are seen as a threat to democracy, people like me are seen as a threat to the existing democracy, when actually what we're trying to do is bolster it and build it up in the face of what really are some existential challenges. So that's probably my opinion. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, I know that's perfect, John. And I mean, starting with the big questions, actually the existential nature of these challenges. And so I, I think that's a nice, introduction and I and it'll lead nicely to um, I wanted to ask you next uh, Pepin because you well you're an elected official in the Brussels regional parliament uh, but you're also campaigning and wanting to push actually for a big change to how that institution functions and from what I've understood about your your work and the way you have framed things it also fits very much in line with what John was talking about is you know if we see citizens in a different way not as not as consumers nor nor as a risk, but people who could actually be tapped um, and brought in productively as a resource into 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 our democratic institutions could fundamentally change things. So, so what do you what do you think about that? And, and please share what you've been working on in Brussels. Thank you, Claudia. Well, yes, uh, maybe let's let's first try to say in a few words um, what brings me or us as Agora Brussels to Parliament is not a classical party program or we're not, we don't even consider ourselves a, a political party, but what Agora stands for is indeed the permanent installation of a citizen's assembly. So a deliberative body um, of randomly selected citizens that actually has a say. And so it becomes a very concrete application of what, what John just said, trying to really shape uh, or, or reshape, reframe, the, the role that citizens take um, in policymaking. The idea of Agora is, is indeed to have this permanent deliberative body. And to get there, we decided to run for office so we would have one seat that would allow us to organize citizens assemblies ourselves, which is what we do, and to defend their decisions in parliament 
to showcase actually the good work they do. And so we have the citizens uh, resolutions that we make or that the assembly makes and that really give me as an MP the voice of the citizens assembly uh, in the parliament. And so we can really put forward citizens uh, ideas and that, that then become, they become actually the agent of their proper, uh, of their own city and of their own political change, which we want them to be. It's a very modest scale for now. It's one MP on 89 uh, MPs, but that's only part of the importance is the, the political weight. I think much more importantly is the symbolic uh, weight of that and the symbolic um, idea behind that is to really give the city back to its citizens and to not have it be, be a, uh, an arena for, for political sort of uh, leverage and play, but really for, for citizen interests and for people to to determine their city in a way. Um, and so in a very modest way, we're trying to implement what, what John is talking about for, um, for, for this sort of reframing of uh, citizens that are now considered often consumers of political ideas and, and turn them into agents of their own political change. Thanks, Pepin. Yeah, I really like that phrase, actually, agents of change. Um, and, you know, so many new possibilities open up when we view people that way. Uh, and this turns nicely actually to Zakia Elvang, who has coined a term that I have been stealing of uh, democratic fitness and how you can be strengthening people's democratic muscles because muscles are something that actually need to be used in order to be strengthened. Um, and you know, you have been behind this initiative for, for quite some time, but also doing all sorts of other work who we do democracy in Denmark at, at all levels of government. So, so yeah, please share what you think about this as well. Sorry. Uh, hi, and um, everybody. Thank you for inviting me here. It's uh, always such a pleasure to be in a good colleague's company, <laughs> having these conversations. So um, we we work in Denmark and then also in Baltic and Nordic countries with a, with a redesign and revitalizing of, of democracy. And um, I think our starting point in these conversations is to try to embrace that democracy is a design, so it can be redesigned. It's not mathematics. It's not kind of carved in stone. It's something that is old and it's been built upon and restructured and reorganized and also context and culture based. And we have to stop treating it like kind of grandma's old, you know, furniture in the in the corner of a living room where we don't dare really to use it. It's it has to be something we 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 not just think is but something we do, something we train, something we practice. Otherwise it's, gonna, otherwise it's gonna turn weak and it's gonna turn incompetent and, uh, and uh, sleepy. And we need a strong and, and uh, competent democracy in order to be able to solve not just these times trouble, but all times troubles. I mean, the, the kind of larger societal issues can only, in my opinion, uh, be solved in a democratic arena. And so I'm kind of, not surprisingly, I'm, demo I'm Democrat to the bone. <laughs> and, I, uh, and, I, and I find it problematic that we, that we have ended up in a corner, at least in my part of the world, where we kind of have a very, uh, a way of working with democracy that's a bit kind of, we don't dare really to touch it. So, so dem democracy is a design, we can redesign it as one point in this conversation and another important point is also the one you mentioned with the democracy fitness, even though it's actually started up as a kind of almost a joke, it ended up becoming a, a huge program. We've been right now we're actually training 10,000 young people in Denmark, where we train them in democratic muscles uh, throughout the next 10 years. So half an hour training programs, we build real uh, training arenas where we train their muscles like listening muscle and empathy and compromising and activism and stuff like that. So um, I think if we want to create arenas where system and, and citizens engage, and that's where it's all about, we have to start redesign and we also have to kind of draw democracy out of the lecture room and into a more active and playful arena where we uh, can actually be as human beings also. And I have tons of other things to say, but I think that's enough for now, isn't it? <laughs> 
I think that's a very, yeah. very good opening. Good. I'm not oh, sure anybody super. expected <laughs> to uh, come to this session and hear about grandma's furniture in the corner, but we all need some, <laughs> some analogies. And I think you're right to say that democracy is something that has changed and is designed and evolves and um, had, you know, the more active element of it, because we think so much about processes and institutions and these things that seem quite far away and, and seem quite abstract and, and over there and also like not to do with us sometimes. Um, so, so that's a good, a good reminder. Um, I want to turn over now to, to Gaitan, who is playing, well, a quite pivotal role in the conference on the future of Europe. Um, so perhaps you can share a little bit, Gaitan, what the conference is for, for our participants who maybe haven't heard about it. Uh, but what I'm also curious about is your thoughts on how you see this perhaps catalyzing a longer term change in terms of people's relationship like with EU institutions, which again, going to what we were just saying, perhaps feel sometimes a bit far away, impersonal, um, you know, not necessarily in people's every day. Um, do you see this conference as something that is already changing that perhaps? And what is the potential to, to change that in the future? Yes, hello everyone, and thank you for having me here and having the opportunity to talk about the conference in the future of Europe, which is a big democratic participatory exercise and with a strong deliberative dimension as well, especially with European citizens panels taking place at the moment. So four randomly selected European citizens assembly that will meet over three weekends and reflecting on the future of Europe. So we are living it right now. I'm just coming back from the first session of the fourth panel, which was in Strasbourg. And it's really exciting to see it happening. Uh, and of course, as you know, it's always very encouraging to see these assemblies just basically working, you know, and, and getting really interesting results. And also, of course, the richness that brings out the diversity. And this is, uh, definitely uh, something very specific also uh, perhaps that I can add to what was already said and was very interesting is that of course if we want to to uh, build up uh, active citizenship as you say democratic fitness uh, we have to take into account more and more the transnational dimension of it because more and more nowadays democracy is happening at local, regional, national, but also transnational, and of course, especially EU level um, for, for the future. So it's very exciting to not only enter the, this, this innovative ground of participatory and deliberative democracy, but also doing that at this very innovative uh, European, pan-European level. Even though I must say the Conference of the Future of Europe is ac actually happening also very much in the member states, where there are also uh, participatory events taking place, national panels organized on some regional uh, citizens panel. I think Belgium is organizing one as, um, since we have our colleague from, from Brussels. So um, it's happening everywhere. And it's also interesting uh, to see that we are building uh, a, a democracy at the urban level, both from a pan-European point of view and from a national Europe in the member states, if you want a uh, point of view. So it's 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 interesting for those who don't know the Conference of the Future of Europe at all. So we are relying basically what we call the three P's. <laughs> so there is a multilingual digital platform where you will have uh, both individual contribution and the report from all these events happening uh, at local level. Then you have the second P, which are the panels, the European citizens panel I was just mentioning, four of them happening during the conference with 200 people uh, each. And then we have the plenary. Actually, uh, we have a meeting next week. And this is also a very innovative ground because um, we, we will, for the first time, basically have an assembly that will mix uh, citizens, uh, 80 of them actually coming from the European citizens panel with all sorts of different components, but a lot of them with politicians. So national parliamentarians, uh, European parliamentarians, people from governments, and also local authorities, uh, organized civil society. So this will make a, a, a new crowd and it will be very interesting to see the interaction and, and what this kind of intermediary step can also bring to these um, participatory processes and see how it works would be very interesting. 
Mm, thanks, Gaitan. No, indeed, it's definitely important and, and quite new and exciting to see this transnational aspect happening with the, the translation to all of the European languages and people really coming together from, from all European countries. Um, on a personal level, it'll, I think it'll be quite good to see this continuing in some form after this one-off conference um, comes to an end and, and the infrastructure is being created around that. But perhaps we can we can return to that a little bit later on um, because I do also want to hear from Dan. And um, so we've heard from well we've heard from a politician, we've heard from some people in public administration, we've heard some from practitioners, and it's also nice to hear an academic perspective on this. Um, so what what are your thoughts and also reactions perhaps to what others said, but related to the work that you've been doing over the years, how do you see the changing role of the relationship between citizens and government? Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, dear two-dimensional people on the screen. And uh, also, hello, dear three-dimensional people on the other side of the screen. I have heard there are many of you back there. And uh, I have been researching lately um, what has happened to homo sapiens, to human being during the quarantine, during the lockdowns, uh, during um, these long periods of isolation and have been collecting stories. So if there is anyone among you who wants to share a story with me, I will gladly listen. Uh, you can get in touch with me by email or any other mean. Uh, but one of the stories really stuck in my mind. Um, it's a story of a Polish woman, young woman. Uh, she works as a UX designer, has a good job, works for companies from London, Paris, uh, US. And she got stuck in her parents' apartment uh, in a Polish city, moved there from another bigger city. And she um, told me, that she hasn't seen a human being for half a year. And then when we talked on Zoom, of course, where else, uh, I wanted to clarify what has happened to her. And okay, then we realized she met actually two people. So first, uh, there was a neighbor who came up when she moved in and said she should stop throwing cigarette bits out through the window. And then after half a year, a person came to her apartment through the couch surfing platform. You know the couch surfing, so a platform for tourists. And what's interesting uh, is that she told me she was actually very annoyed by the person, afraid of the person, but not because he would do something uh, to her, but because he moved here and there in the apartment and she couldn't focus on him because she was used to, to speaking to people from 40 centimeters of distance. So she was used to speak with people on screens. And she's actually, in my opinion, a prototype of the human of the COVID age, homo covidensis. We have turned, transformed into something new. And this is really a worrying fact. We have spent already in 2019, in the pre-COVID age, uh, nine hours per day, adults, nine hours per day in front of screens, smartphones, computers, tablets, etc., uh, TVs. And last year, uh, according to some research, during lockdowns, 13 hours per day. So this is really something radically new for people. And what we do here now, this is actually not virtual reality anymore. This is more real reality than the physical reality outdoors. We have spent so much time indoors in front of screens that we have forgotten about the importance of physical reality. And this is, in my opinion, the biggest challenge for the future of the European Union, how to come together again, not only digitally, physically, in open space, to communicate in the way humans have communicated for the last 300,000 years. What we do here now, is com something completely new. We have been doing this for, what, 10, perhaps 15 years. And if we want to establish a new kind of democracy, digital democracy or digitized democracy, we shouldn't forget about the analog component of the democracy. 
Mm. Thank you, Dan, for those opening remarks. I'm really glad that you brought that up, actually, because, well, first of all, I didn't know those stats in particular, though it's perhaps not that surprising, even if it's scary to think that on average people have been spending 13 hours a day in front of various screens. But I think we talked so much recently about kind of a move to digital democracy, and even when we've been talking about deliberative processes, how they've moved online in the past year and a half due to COVID. I think for, for some people, there's a sense that, oh, well, maybe this is just the future because we've seen that it is possible to do this. Um, but also speaking to practitioners, and I'd be curious to think about what you, like uh, John and Zakia, think as people who have been perhaps more involved on the ground and delivering these processes, think that actually we really miss out on something when we do it just online. And I think what Dan was saying too about the, the actual physical democratic spaces that we have, those spaces end up shaping the relationships that we create too, and what's what's even possible in them. So, so John, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think it's I think it's absolutely true that the the the, the sort of the face to face uh, the value of face to face contact is is immense, and you and you we'll never we'll never overcome the challenges of our of our society without without face to face contact. I, I would also say though that I think I think what I'm really interested in more than anything in this kind of conversation is 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 power and and where that power is and where it meaningfully is. And I think that that applies online and offline. It applies in in the context of of things like the the the, the conference on the future of Europe and on and on things like the climate assembly that happened in the UK, where I'm where I'm from. And it, there's the the danger of um, and it applies to the ownership of these spaces, particularly when they're whether they're offline or online. That the that the own the the the, the privatization of public space. Both in both in online terms, which is widely discussed, and sort of brings the brings the the, the mode of the consumer, which I was talking about, into into these spaces where we're discussing where, when when the, when the business models of the spaces where political discussion happens are are premised essentially on consumption on on advertising, that that creates a a, a quite quite unhealthy dynamic, whether that space is digital or not. And then, and then, and then, when you think about the extent to which actually public space, so take take the the land outside outside uh, city hall in London is no is not publicly owned. It's and and so even that space is is there. There are sort of certain things off limits. So I think that's very interesting. I think that that's sort of part of the power question. I'm also really interested in terms of in terms of the questions of power, like take the conference of the future of Europe which by the way I think is a wonderful thing and uh, and I'm saying yes and to it in huge fashion like more of that and further but like the what actually is the contract of power that that, that citizens participating in that meaningfully have I think is a really important question and one that we shouldn't pretend isn't there and, I, and I'm not saying Jetan is pretending but it's it's like when when this this shift in the relationship between citizen and state must be a shift in power. It, mu it must be a shift that, that is about saying uh, w government states need to trust citizens and, and put meaningful power in the hands of citizens. Otherwise, it's, it's, it, we're just dressing something up that is, that is an, an, an almost co-opting. So I'd, I'd really encourage us to sort of be in that space of like, how does this, how does this shift that is emerging and happening and and that the conference of the future of europe is pushing on at scale and that the the things that zakia and i are doing and that pepin's doing are sort of pushing on in different ways and but but we're not like what does it look like for that really to 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 make that transition in 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 the terms of the power relationship between citizen and state i, I don't know if i've articulated that, that brilliantly but i hope it's i hope it's helpful yeah, no, I think you raised the actually the key question, which is at the heart of the, what we're talking about, which is power. And um, Zaki, I know that you want to come come in on this again, and I'd also like to bring in Gaitan after to, to share some thoughts about. Um, I mean, what John you were saying about the conference on the on the future of Europe. You know, what is actually the contract of power there? And I think it's also something that it seems to be of interest to the people who are virtually here with us as well, because some of the questions are about how do we ensure that that those proposals are translated into actual initiatives 
and then subjected to accountability. So this also, I think, requires different notions of legitimacy and accountability when we actually shift power to. Um, and then another question that came up in, in the chat was about examples of sustained feedback loops between decision makers and citizens beyond these one-time harvests. So how can we make sure that citizens can feel their own political efficacy, efficacy sorry, when they choose to participate? I think all of these questions are very much related. So with that larger scope of, of questions to think about, Zakia, what, what I wanted to bring you into. I, I think I'm just gonna, thank you, Claudia. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of add on an extra note to John's comments uh, for, for, uh, for the Conference of Future of Europe, because we, we run uh, some of these uh, citizen consultations in Denmark as a part of the conference. And, uh, uh, and we've been putting uh, quite a lot of uh, kind of heartfelt blood and passion into trying to design something that's meaningful and actually can recruit people that want to participate in uh, these sessions. And, and uh, my, uh, my deep fear in this is that we're gonna, we're gonna end up not just disappointing them, but actually letting them down a bit because uh, they're gonna be part of something which is meaningful as kind of the one-off uh, kind of uh, uh, thing, uh, you know, where you meet someone and it's just uh, very romantic and sweet, but it's not really a long-term relationship. They're just gonna contribute to a one-time conversation, but not really a, uh, a more long-lasting love relationship because I'm a bit afraid that it's going to be one-sided in the sense that that uh, we want the citizens to participate in the future of, uh, of Europe, but we don't really want to mandate them any kind of uh, real uh, power. So that's one thing. And then another thing is, um, I'm just curious. I mean, you guys that are a bit more close to the Brussels arena, do you trust anything is going to change as an outcome of the conference, the future of Conference of Europe? Because... I honestly have to admit, I don't think so. So, so just, I really wish that some of you could comfort my a bit troubled soul because I'm going to have all these citizens in a room where I have to put confidence into them. And I feel a bit uncomfortable when I listen to some of the talk on the kind of more policy, uh, higher policy arena on, on the output of this. So can we trust anything will actually change as an output from, from that conference? Um, well, I think on, on this note, I think I can. What do you think? Well, obviously, I'm not the politician in here. I'm just a, an organizer of the conference, and I try to put everything in place so that the citizens can be empowered. At least uh, uh, this is this is for sure. But I, I can say a few things uh, that make me believe that something is changing. Uh, first of all, that... Uh, I, I have in in the documents, the founding documents, I would say of the of the conference. I have seen wording that I have never seen before, like uh, very strong words on the follow up. Uh, me, uh, President von der Leyen in her State of the Union speech uh, had a few sentences on the conference in her speech, and she specifically chose that sentence on the follow up. So I mean, this is meaningful, and uh, then it's a matter of making sure that these words mean something, but I think that this this is a really good first start that we need to consider. Um, then the, the second is, I think that I have the feeling from the inside that really everything is done to put the citizens at the center of the conference. That's saying it's a citizens conference. And I can tell you that this in, in, uh, involves sometimes even some you know, a uh, discussion, strong discussion with some of the politicians who would like to be more <laughs> uh, driving this and realize that, for example, in the plenary, the agenda is set by the recommendations coming from the citizens, that in the working group who are going to be the spokesperson of the working groups, they are coming from the citizens component. All these things that uh, make a change uh, to which the politicians are not used, you know, so for me, there is a, a, a bit of a silent revolution uh, there uh, that is interesting to, to witness. Then, of course, what is very important will be uh, like the, the, the landing zone, of course, uh, which is something I cannot completely uh, predict now. But I have this feeling that at least the intention uh, and the conditions that uh, are put into place to empower citizens are there. Um, 
then of course you know politics is politics there are things changing government changing etc so but i have a, this feeling that there is a strong realization that if nothing happens this is a potentially a higher political risk that if something happens uh, i think that we are we are in this balance now people know something has to happen something has to change that's on substance then on formats I believe there will be a before and an after conference. That's for sure. I mean, I think that we are moving towards using more and more this kind of processes, that it's proving to work, that the people who were never attending these kind of assemblies have attended and are really enthusiastic about it. I mean, all colleagues from institutions coming, go out of there thinking this is fantastic, you know? So I think in terms of culture change, uh, there is a real one going going on there, uh, and I really think that there will be things put into place also after the conference that will be uh, more permanent uh, tools in the toolbox of the European Union uh, that will allow more meaningful uh, citizens' participation. That's my assessment. <laughs> I may be proved wrong, but that's what I believe. <laughs> Thanks, Kaitan. No, it's definitely very valuable to hear your thoughts on this because you're really at the heart of this. And I mean, clearly are, are there also with the intention of making this meaningful for people and for there to be real change at the end of it. I think as John and as Zakia are saying, the question remains to be seen. Like it's very good to see the cultural change and to see the follow-up being mentioned, but what form that takes and when and how is, is not entirely clear. So I think that's where some of the question and the, and the interest in, in this comes from. Um, Pepin, I think you wanted to come back on, on something Gaitan had said earlier. And then I also wanted to bring Dan and um, John back in as well. Yeah, thank you, Claudia. Also, well, much of what I wanted to say has actually been said by, by John as well in reaction to what Gaitan said in her opening uh, statements, which is on, on the actual the follow-up and the actual change of power relation. I think indeed the, the conference is a great idea and it should be also creating a real impact on, on the lives of the people involved. Um, and this is often lacking, I think. Very often when we see these deliberative um, processes happening with um, people that are randomly selected or not that can have their say, in policy making, or they can have um, a discussion with others, be they politicians or fellow citizens, to come up with policy proposals. Too often, it stays very free. It's just a recommendation. It's just something that can be implemented or not. And that, in the end, depends on political uh, will to implement it or, to, or not. And then, then maybe you already get to turn around this idea of, okay, then you create, you have the citizen create a menu, uh, but then the politicians can still pick what dish they like or not. And this is, I think, not the way we should look at these processes. We should not look at them as a tool that we can use for some issues when it can be useful, um, especially if then the follow-up is not assured. I think it's important that we really do change this power relationship and that we do say, okay, governments trust their citizens. Um, democracy is all about that. It's about trusting your, your fellow citizens, it's about trusting the process, it's trusting the people. And I think if we are not ready to do that, it's it can be indeed dangerous, uh, even as I think Zakia mentioned as well, for the people that participate to be frustrated, to not see uh, their real the, the real impact of these processes. And um, by not giving them the legitimacy that they deserve, it could be counterproductive to organize these kind of one of uh, things if, if the follow up is not um, actually assured. And I'm, I'm thinking, for example, what happened in, in France with the Convention du Climat, where there was a, a strong wording for follow up, but which did not happen for all of the recommendations and where there is a lot of frustration for the people that participated. So I think there's it's not just the theoretical. There is real, um, some real examples of, um, of these processes not being optimal and therefore potentially being counterproductive. Also here in Brussels, with our, um, we have these mixed committees where, where randomly selected citizens discuss with MPs 
and together they make policy proposals. But somehow within this entire parliamentary setting, um, the power remains with the, the MPs and they can put forward amendments that, that can change the, the meaning of, of certain recommendations, which is super confusing for the people participating. And the follow-up is assured in the sense that politicians have to say six months later what they've done with it. So it's, it's steps in the good direction. I think we're really working on this and getting forward. But yes, yes and, rather than yes but, yes and we need to go further. We need to really trust our citizens into making these decisions and, uh, and adhere to them. Uh, I think that that's really important to stress here. Mm. Thank you, Pepin. Yeah, I think this this phrase of yes and will probably define what how how we see things on this panel. And I, I I like how you also point out right now that same reframing of the usual trust dilemma about the problem or one of the big problems being governments needing to trust citizens a lot more. Um, John, I I see you nodding, and and I know you also wanted to come come in again about the role of, of civil society in all of this as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and be brief so I know Dan wants to come in and, and maybe take it somewhere else. But I I um I just wanted to say that I don't I think there's also a pressure and a and a demand on us as citizens and on and on civil society organizations to step into our power in, uh, as it's offered and to do so in, in good faith. So I, I, I think I think there is a demand on government institutions to to, as Pepin puts it, sort of trust citizens, and and, and I think it needs to start there. Actually, I think the, the the building of trust will start will need to start from the inside out rather than the outside in. But I do think there's a there, there is a challenge to us to, to to step up to as well. When the when the hand of the state is extended, when the opportunity to kind of to to exert meaningful power is offered, that we don't reject it. And and what I'm thinking of very specifically is the UK context. And and this might be an unpopular interpretation among some, but um, when the when the climate assembly when when Extinction Rebellion held their first protests a few years back, they were they were actually very popular and they had a they had a very strong popular mandate. And, and it resulted in, it didn't result in the executive commissioning a citizen assembly, but, which was the demand, but it did result in six select committees of our parliament commissioning a, a citizen's assembly on climate. And it wasn't, it wasn't exactly the terms that were, that were requested by, by the XR demands, and it wasn't exactly the, the commissioner that was required. But there was a citizen's assembly on climate, which had been the sort of headline demand. And I believe that that, that that actually, like the the reaction of, of extinction rebellion to that was to was to sort of reject that that hand was to say not good enough. And I think there's a really important challenge there because if I if take the the, the, the sort of hypothetical that they'd said yes and in that moment to, to continue the theme of this conversation if they said brilliant there's a there's a citizen assembly and we're going to hide we're going to pay close attention and we're going to do kitchen table conversations all over the country and we're going to rally our members and 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 when the report's published we're going to we're going to challenge government to adopt it and we're going to we're going to really build the energy of civil society to to sort of to, and then you kind of end up in a virtuous circle, a virtuous cycle of, of power being offered and taken and more asked for, and then being more offered and taken and more asked for. And I think that this, this moment in time requires a kind of both an opening, a, a reaching out of the sort of the hand of power to out, outside of, of the existing institutions and structures, but it also requires that hand to be, to be taken. And I think that, that, that this moment in time is really character, is going to be characterized by whether we can all sort of step into our roles in that and not not sort of perceive it just as the problem of, of politicians and institutions. That's my view. Mm, I think you raise an, uh, an important tension that's that's real and that I don't think there's a, a kind of right answer to what you point out to it in the sense that it's on the one hand, it's obviously great that there are more of these initiatives happening. You know, I don't want to comment directly on the UK situation that you mentioned, but let's just continue with it as an example, because I think there's that balance to be struck between doing something that's actually really being done well in a way that's meaningful, that would shift power, that gives people a real chance to influence things. Um, but at the same time, if those conditions aren't there, you know, what's the reaction to it? it because I think as Zakia was saying earlier, there is a genuine risk that if these processes are happening, but then their outputs are being completely ignored or they're being done in a way that doesn't inspire public confidence, it could actually be doing more harm than good. Um, so I think that 
that's perhaps one, I don't know, tension that arises, but I totally see what you're saying about this notion of yes and, that okay, it wasn't perfect. Um, and we see now actually it has had more impact than I think many people who criticized it earlier thought that it would. Um, but, uh, but I do see the, the concerns. Um, Dan, I, I wanted to let you come back in on that as well. And then Gaitan um, would be good to get your thoughts on, on what we've heard in terms of the reactions related to the conference in the future of Europe again. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to get back to something John said before uh, about the public and private sphere, because I think it's really important to stress this here in this conversation. Uh, privacy is in Europe currently and globally also as endangered, in my opinion, as the uh, global environment. And uh, we should, if we want to protect the democracy, we should also protect the right for privacy. And the public uh, sphere has started to disappear also because we have spent so much time in front of screens. What we do here now, we do it in, on a public, on a private platform, Zoom. And um, we spend time on Twitter, Facebook. We do democracy on Twitter, Facebook, and on other uh, social media platforms. And I think it's really dangerous because uh, through this, um, what we're actually doing is not establishing a digital democracy. What we do is actually feeding the digital capitalism or surveillance capitalism, as Zhuzhana Zubov uh, calls it. I actually believe it's not a capitalism anymore. It's actually more a feudalism, a new type of feudalism, digital feudalism. And we are all servants of the feudalism because we spend time, okay, not now, but uh, in the afternoon, what we do in front of screens, this is what we do for free. And somebody else is paid for this. So first thing we should do is turn around the business model, in my, op my opinion. If we spend time in front of screens, we should get paid for this, not somebody on the other side of the screen. If I use a uh, uh, device, smartphone, which constantly tracks me uh, and um, can follow my um, how I communicate and with whom. I mean, I should get paid for this. Not, not that I'm paying a monthly fee and for the device. So, okay, if my information is worth, I don't know, 150 euros, this should be my fee, my monthly fee. So this is one thing we should do. And another thing, we should all, we should all be allowed to switch off I think this is really important for the future of democracy to be invisible whenever we want to be, whenever we decide to be. But are we? Even if we go uh, for a walk to a forest, I mean, then we have devices with us, smartphones, um, smart watches, measuring our activities, pulse, etc. So are we really free? I think we have become actually servants or even slaves to the digital feudalism. And this is also some kind of bifurcation, the um, crossroads of two subspecies of Homo sapiens. I mentioned before Homo covidensis, human of the, com uh, of the COVID age. And there is another species too that was described already by uh, Harari, Homo deus. So there is this global elite of people who uh, live from our data, like Jeff mm -hmm. Bezos, Bill Gates, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, etc. Last year, uh, Jeff Bezos earned almost 100 billion uh, dollars in one year. He himself as a physical person. So he's a kind of overlord of the digital feudalism. And we should do something together to turn around this kind of uh, bifurcation to bring together homo deus and homo covidensis to be homo sapiens again. Mm. Thanks, Dan. No, I, I think it's I think it's good that you're adding that into this conversation because I mean, in some ways, immediately I felt like, oh, this is kind of taking things off track. But actually, no. I think what you're pointing out is really quite relevant when we're going back to the issue of power, because through the fact that basically, like you're saying public space, whether digital or otherwise, has been completely privatized. This has a huge impact on the power imbalance between huge tech companies and other organizations are able to then influence all sorts of decisions which citizens are being left out of, but actually being able to meaningfully have a say in and shape the future of. 
Um, Gaetan, I, I also wanted to, to come back to you on, on what we were talking about earlier, because there were quite a few reactions to what you said, and I also want to give you a chance to be able to come back on, on what was said and, and share some other thoughts on it. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think we, we are all concerned about the impact that these uh, these exercises have. Uh, and and I'm not sure, also, although that we, we are enough um, reflecting ourselves on when do we think the impact is worthwhile or not. Uh, I think, uh, obviously, not everyone would have the same interpretation of that. Uh, definitely, I consider that for me, the impact of the conference, as, an, as I analyze it, it now, I think it's worthwhile. But uh, one thing that I think we, we don't do properly uh, is to very much explain, um, and perhaps we don't all agree on this, but this is not direct democracy, right? We are asking people to join a process and some of their recommendations will make their way into the legislative uh, process. Some will not. Uh, and as, as long as we are clear uh, with the citizens about that, uh, I think it's OK. Uh, and I think it's fine. This is they are complementing, coming to complement representative democracy. They are empowered because they will be hurt, but not everything they say will be taken on board as long as we are clear uh, and maybe we should be clearer about that at the beginning uh, then it's it's a bit the tension and the trust is a bit perhaps a bit more relaxed i this was clearly for me the case for the climate convention in france where the no filter concept uh, I think at the end brought a, a disappointment uh, in this from a citizen's point of view where perhaps in five years' time, when we will analyze the impact of that convention, it might it it, it is actually probably quite high. I don't know. I'm I'm I'm, I'm trying a, a guess here, but uh, it seems to me that it 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 created a disappointment because the first words were not clear enough. My, in an ideal world, I think we should try to commit to at least a percentage. You know, saying we uh, commit to maybe follow up on X percentage of your recommendation. It's uh, uh, for example, I, I think um, in Italy, the Democratic Party now is doing uh, an exercise like this, and they've committed to uh, follow up on 50% of the citizens' ID. So something that I, at least you can evaluate at the end, because otherwise it's always left to an interpretation of what is a success, what is not, what is really an impact, what is not an impact. Um, so that's that would be my first, my first comment. The, the second, is, is really uh, that I feel sometimes that we are in a way very innovative in the way we conceive these processes because we want to, sh to, to shake a bit democracy and, and make it more fit. But we are, um, so we are trying to innovate there, but we are a bit traditional in the way we envisage the response and the impact. We, we, we basically say it's all in the hands of the politicians to decide uh, on what we should do afterwards. Uh, but we want to empower citizens at the beginning, but not so much at the end anymore. It's and if it, if the government or the, the the public authority that is doing it is not doing enough, then it's a failure. But are we thinking more about these things also to to give directions for more people than just the government, which is the mandator, but also maybe organize civil society, uh, citizens groups that would then federate around the results to make some movements, you know. So I think we need also to think about, you know, what what are do we really mean when we say it has to have an impact? Uh, and yeah, that's just a, a, a mm. food for thought that I'm, <laughs> that I'm bringing it here. Yeah, no, I think those are really fair, fair questions. And I know that Zaki wants to come in on that, but I, I also noticed that in, in the chat amongst the participants, one of the questions I think really touches on this, or actually it's more of a, a comment, but I think it relates to what you were just saying, Gaitan, is in that um, they were saying, what we are talking about are the birthing pains while transitioning from representative democracy, where all decisions are delegated to elected officials and participatory democracy, where citizens are demanding a role in decision making. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that this whole tension also raises another question, though, because often we 
think about these new processes, like especially citizens' assemblies, as a new form of innovative citizen participation, but actually a more accurate way of conceptualizing them is as a new form of representation where the people involved in them are citizen representatives. Um, and when we start to think of it that way, actually that gives us a whole new conception of what that means for the future of representative democracy, because it means actually rethinking and redesigning representative democracy rather than replacing it with participatory or direct or other forms of democracy um, itself, because those are quite different in, in nature. So I kind of wonder what you think about that, Zakia, and then wanted to pick on you as well, Pepin, as someone who's elected, but also pushing for that more radical, permanent, institutional change that I think actually Gaitan was talking about a little bit. So Zakia. Yeah, thank you both of you for to you, Gatsan, and you, Claudia, for also kind of pointing at the representation. I, I agree completely. Very, very interesting. We have also kind of reframing it. But just one note to uh, Gatsan, and that's on the on the impact question, because I think you're actually completely right. I mean that we we kind of tend to be, be very interested in redesigning the kind of kind of the the pre-processes and the process of interaction but we tend to kind of show the after process uh, too little not just creativity but also focus and I was just thinking that some years ago I've been working with democracy festivals and kind of all Baltic and the Scandinavian countries which are in Denmark it's 100,000 people gathering for three days in on Bonholm but that's another story but just what I wanted to say in this context is that that at that in that arena we 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 had the same conversation. What's actually the impact of a democracy festival? How can we see it's actually doing good for? How, is it actually changing or bringing any value into our democracy that we meet in, in three days and have conversations on society, etc. And and we ended up designing uh, some Im democratic impact goals for what was actually the effect or the impact of the festival. And the interesting part of that process was basically. Be kind of realizing that if we wanted the festival to have an impact on society, we actually needed a new language to talk about it. So the impact was not just legislation or politics, it was also trust building, stronger networks, meeting people you didn't know already, being inspired to new ways of participating, uh, feeling engaged, uh, meeting people with, with a vision for society. So the kind of the wider range of possible democratic impacts uh, is has to kind of we need a language for that and we need a shared kind of impact focus in order to be able to see what's actually the impact of also deliberative processes so it might be kind of I would just I mean having a conversation on that what's actually the impact of, of the future of Europe and, and trying to build a language for that would be a very very interesting conversation I think. Mm. No, it's super, super interesting, Zach, yeah, this need for actually thinking about the language. And actually, to me, that goes back to why I love the concept of democratic fitness so much, because I've always thought of that as one of the main desirable impacts of any form of, of participatory or deliberative process, in addition to any direct change on policy, because there is so much evidence which shows the just transformative effect it has on people who are involved in terms of strengthening their sense of agency and political efficacy. And that is definitely not to be undermined or undervalued. Um, so, so thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, I'll go to Pepin and then to John, you wanted to come in. And then I also just wanted to share that we have some results from the, the poll that we asked at the beginning of the, of, the, of the session as well about, are you more or less hopeful about the future of democracy today compared to the beginning of last year? Now, I don't know about what you were anticipating, but the results are that 48% are less hopeful, 19% are more hopeful, and 34% are about the same. Um, so if you also wanted to share any, any reactions to that, I'm um, curious what you think and if that chimes with your own perception on the future. Um, but Pepin, to come back to you about this question about impact and also about perhaps more transformative institutional change. Yeah, um, I think there's, of course, a great effect of all these, um, let's call them experiments that are happening nowadays even if the impact is not like one-on-one, -on -one, 100% will implement what you say. So I think by itself that that is a good thing. 
by itself that strengthens um, what, what Zakia calls so nicely democratic fitness. I do, I do believe in that and I do think that's important. And I do also think that doing this over and over and over again will generate a sort of demand for that and a, um, it will lead in the end maybe to more radical actual change. However, I think it's, I always find it strange when I talk with other MPs or with, with leaders of political parties and I, I ask them whether they're favorable of having, uh, let's say a citizen's Senate in Belgium, for example, where there's still a Senate, but it's more symbolical than it's, it's an actual two chamber system. Um, and so, let's say the idea of filling that with randomly selected citizens and give them the time and uh, a salary so they can really delve into public matters of general interest during a year or so, have rotation, etc., cetera, um, and give them an actual say um, in, in legislation. They're typically not super eager. And very often they say, okay, we need to test it first. We need to see if they will make the right kinds of decisions. Um, and I find this kind of weird in, in the terms that, for example, when we, uh, when we implemented the women's right to vote, we did not say, let's test it first, let's see if they vote properly. And maybe this, this is sort of, it's a crude uh, analogy, I know. But in a way, if you don't trust people to make the right decisions, then why would you trust them to vote on the right people? That's sort of a similar thing. So I, I do believe that this trust is really important. And I do um, have trust as well that change is coming and it will happen, but I'm also afraid it's happening too slowly and that therefore um, some of these one of projects are just, can be used to the advantage of people that sort of cherry pick their, um, the things that they like uh, in policy and then implement it and say like, hey, but we've done it. We've listened to the citizens panel. And this is why I'm not super favorable of, for example, saying, okay, we'll follow up on 50% of your recommendations. Because if uh, that's sort of the, uh, the, the standard, then a policymaker can very well just pick the 50% of things that were already foreseen in, in policy, just omit the other half and say that they've listened to the citizens. So I think even if it's by itself a good thing that we're experimenting with it, and even if we see that there is sometimes follow-up, I do think it's important to really be honest. And I, I, that touches also upon what Gaetan said, like even if we're not gonna follow up on everything, we should say so. I think that's, that's crucial. At least say what you do and do what you say. That's, that's uh, like a key motto for me in, in anything that concerns democracy and, and transparency. Um, that's super important. And of course, ideally, you'll say that you'll implement all of the recommendations that come from the liberative uh, democracy, and then you will also do uh, what you just said. So that, that's the ideal. But I think we're a far away from that, but we're getting there closely. Uh, these experiments help, but I would like to see it uh, happening faster and more institutionalized as we're experimenting with in Belgium. Mm. Thanks, Stefan. Indeed, I mean, I, I think you're not the only one who has this sense that perhaps things are, are moving in the right direction for sure, but still moving too slowly and going back to that crucial question of power that we talked about, you know, there's a lot more of these processes happening, but there's still a lot of the cherry picking that you're talking about. And is that actually shifting power if that's what is happening? Um, I mean, we are going to publish a new paper next month that has eight different models of the way that deliberative democracy is being institutionalized. Um, but it's still in that kind of complementary way and we haven't seen anything that goes that that next step and actually gives just full genuine power to to citizens either um so i don't know john as the yes and person in our in our group what do you what do you think do you do you think that Pepin is being too too i don't know cynical or pessimistic that it's not happening fast enough or um i don't know and also in reaction to the poll results about most people who are here with us actually feeling less optimistic at the moment I'm, I mean, I'll save what I think about that. 
<laughs> I'm tempted to jump in, but I'm the moderator, so over to you. <laughs> oh, you told you, you're, you're pretty much world expert on an awful lot of this stuff, and uh, and anyone who's tuning into this probably knows it. So, uh, so I think he, having the odd contribution from odd abuse of the chair's role is is entirely suitable. I, I mean, I, the couple of things I wanted to chip in on, and then I'll try and shut up because I have a bad habit. But um, the the just on. I mean, on that, I, I'm I am a yes and person, but I think I think to this to this I, I like I I think I think what I would say is is there are there is both both movement in the right direction and an awful lot of movement in the wrong direction uh, and an awful lot of movement as well in a in an absolutely terrifying direction, all all going on at once right now, and I think that's that's that for me has been the story of the last eighteen months. Like I think pre-COVID it felt to me like there was a sort of there was a rising of this of this sort of citizen story whether that's assemblies or or, or kind of input processes or or crowdfunding and match match crowdfunding and and all these sorts of things that are that I think qualify as modes of participation I think are all really valuable not and I and I do worry sometimes as you know that, that, that we talk a little too much about assemblies and not enough about the broad sweep of modes of participation but but I am um, but I think that in the last 18 months, to make my kind of key point, I think we've, we're in this moment in time where, where, the, the, where we know, we kind of know that the, that the structures of our society are broken, that they are leading us inevitably, that, that, that their intrinsic tensions and intrinsic contradictions are leading us into disaster, whether that's ownership of, of social media or whether it's uh, sort of the, the 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 faith in market solutions on climate. It's it, these things are just aren't holding. That story isn't working, and that story represents itself in in sort of existing representative democracy, where the only mode of the citizen is to vote. And that that is that. It, but that does have that does still have a very strong kind of campaign behind it, a very strong energy behind it that is quite resistant to change in part for good reason because it can see authoritarianism and kind of and and really sort of some really dark stuff rising behind it and and yet this sort of yet at the same time there is this sort of more more participatory more open future not just in in formal democracy but in every aspect of society whether it's whether it's business or or movements or whatever it's it's happening everywhere and I, and I think so. So to bring that back to kind of, I, I think I, I think the I think people are I, I'm with I'm with a lot of people. I, I sort of feel both more hopeful and less hopeful and about the same all at the same time. And I think it's I think ultimately it's like hope is about there's a difference for me between optimism and hope. Optimism is I think Rebecca Solnit put it like this the first time. She said optimism is the belief that things will be all right no matter what we do. And she distinguishes that from hope, which she says is hope. Hope is under, hope is a combination of clarity and imagination. The clarity to see the world for what it is, and the imagination to un, to see what could be if and only if we get involved. So I think that I, I find that very powerful, and I, and I will always be a hopeful person as a result of holding that definition. That like we can, you don't know what's going to happen, and precisely in that sort of unknowableness of the future is the opportunity to get stuck in and, and do stuff. And I guess that's the energy I would want to sort of shut up with. <laughs> I think that's a very nice way for, for you to, to shut up with that thought. Not that I would ever want you to shut up, um, just using your own phrase. But I really love that Solnit quote about clarity and, and imagination. And I'm going to take that as your as your closing thoughts on the personal commitment also going forward, because I'm conscious actually we're getting close to the end of our time, which has just flown by and I wish we could actually continue this conversation further but I want to have um, all the other panelists have a chance to, to share their closing thoughts and focusing more on what is like what is your personal commitment actually to driving this change forward that we've been talking about for the past um, you know hour and a bit and um, so so Dan over over to you what what is your personal commitment to, to this? Yeah, so uh, I'll get back to something what Pepin said before. In my opinion, it's really important, most important to trust the people and to make finally also in the democratic decision making solutions, a shift from the expert based solutions. So we know what's good for you 
to people-centered solutions, that we identify first uh, the groups of people that will be using the solutions, then uh, analyze them by going to people, talking to them, by using all kinds of anthropological approaches, if you want, to stay with them. I mean, face-to-face -face interaction is here really important. And plus, we need the mm -hmm. step three, interpretation of the solutions with the people. We should invite the people on the other side of the screen who are listening now to us, to the session. And we need them here in this democratic <laughs> decision-making. And then we need yes, the sure. step four, testing the solution, if it works or not. And usually it doesn't. So let's get back to people going back to people and repeat the process, this is very important. And in this way, we will get solutions that will be made with the people, not just for the people. Mm, thank you, Dan. Um, Gaitan, what are your closing thoughts for the, for the session? Um, I just would like perhaps because we've talked about cultural change among politicians, but I think I also think that we might need what in the media um, sector as well. My, my feeling, because as was, as was John was saying, I feel that indeed both trends are at work in society, uh, but somehow one is relatively peaceful and not conflictual and another one is conflictual. And of course the conflictual attracts media attention. And I think, I also think that we need a culture chain in the media that they get interested also in something that is innovative and looking to the future and relatively peaceful <laughs> in terms of interaction within democracy because i have i think that for these uh, processes to be impactful they need visibility because visibility even for a politician who don't want to go uh, for, forward with this visibility will force that politician to do something because you know it's it's there it's in the air so we need the media to come and follow these kind of processes, to be interested and to consider that by doing that, they are also making their contribution to democracy and not just by following what's happening between politicians and the conflicts. And the... yeah, I know it's wishful thinking, <laughs> but I'm saying this because I think it's part of, uh, you know, how we can progress uh, on, on, on these issues is by bringing more the, the media attention and the visibility. Mm. No, I mean, I, I think you're right that the visibility is definitely necessary for impact. And it's a lot less exciting sometimes to report about people having quite civilized conversations together in a room um, and that this is transforming democracy, but um, definitely need to be pushing for it. So good to hear there's a commitment to, to really encourage cultural change in that direction as well. Um, Zakia? Also love to hear your personal commitment and what you're. Uh, yeah. Two things, I think. Um, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I'm, I run a private company, and I think we haven't been talking a lot about the private sector in that sense. I mean, we've been talking about civil society and, and the, and the system-based democracy. I think lots of lots of the changes we see actually come from entrepreneurs and, the, and, the, and, and people that actually do quite a lot of democratic innovation from the, from the private sector practices. So there's kind of in, in my world, at least a hybrid between the public sector and the civil society and the, and the private entrepreneurs is a rather crucial key to, to solving some of these problems because we do need the kind of long-term representative part of, of the public arena, but we also need the more kind of fast-paced, <laughs> risk-willing, innovative uh, energy you can, you can build in, in smaller corporations. So that's one thing. And another thing is I, I am... We, we are running a, a place in Copenhagen called the Democracy Garage, which is a kind of a service center for deliberative democracy and participatory democracy, where we try to build uh, kind of design and build more specific solutions to more specific and culture-based uh, uh, democratic problems. And, and, and so kind of my commitment is, is uh, running a, a small space in Copenhagen where all the, our democracy sector can meet up and build more specific problems. And I think um we, we kind of we need those smaller also physical arenas to to bridge between the different uh, uh silos of democracy 
So I'm, I'm holding that space. <laughs> That's nice to, to hear about. And I think that connects nicely to one of the things that we talked about earlier, which I think Dan brought up about the need actually for the physical democratic spaces for, for democracy to be possible. Well, last but not least, I would love to hear, Pepin, what your thoughts are about your personal commitment to be driving this change forward. Thank you, Claudia. Um, well, I heard, I heard a lot of great things and it, it reminded me of this um, mixed committee that we have now, which is uh, working on the citizens' engagement in crisis uh, management, of course, linked to, to the COVID crisis we're having now, um, where the citizens sort of really stress the importance of involving them at all stages of the policy making cycle, um, which is also what was mentioned earlier. And so I think I'd like to be rather than wishful thinking into hopeful thinking. I really liked the uh, um, definition that uh, John put forward. And so my commitment would be, I think, to keep pointing policymakers to the importance of listening to citizens, to really engage in this dialogue and to really have this more inclusive, more deliberative, more impactful, meaningful democracy. Um, and, and if that is the, the small thing or the big thing, it takes quite a bit of effort. Uh, to uh, that I can do to make at least Brussels a city that is more by its citizens uh, than for its citizens, or rather by and for its citizens, then um, then I'll be happy uh, to have to have been doing that. Yes, for sure. Wonderful. Thank you, Patrin. And I mean, I know, well, I think you are doing an amazing job. And I think all of you who are here on the panel with us are doing an amazing job to drive this change forward. I think if I have one Kind of concluding thought to to what was a very rich discussion it was this notion of like yes and like there's a lot happening it's going in the right direction uh, we need the media to cover it more so that perhaps a wider group of people feel like this change is happening and is and it's going on but um if it's really about shifting power relationships we're maybe not quite there yet and a few more steps need to be taken in that direction. So, so thank you everyone to, to, for your time. Thank you to Dan, Pepin, John, Gaitan and Zakia. Thank you to everyone who was very interactive on the platform as well. And we look forward to continuing this conversation in many different ways. So thank you very much and have a good evening, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you, bye.